Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show Lady Boss knows what women want to be free to speak their voice, to live in financial freedom and build businesses that radiate wealth, leaving legacies we can be proud of. Every Friday, we bring you Lady Boss entrepreneurs that are changing the world. Diane Solano, the energy entrepreneur. Dana Terrio, handle the lump, heal your life. And Joan Sharp, changing the conversation from money to vision. See you Friday. Hi, welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. My name is Dana Terrio co-host here on the Lady Boss program, Handle the Lump, Heal Your Life series, airing every fourth Friday. And today we are absent our favorite Queen Lady Boss host, so we will miss you, Cornelia. But with us instead is a very special Lady Boss that I'm so excited to talk to today. Before I introduce our lovely lady today, I'd like to um, share our topic title today, which is Heal Sinatra style, my way for radical remission. So a bit of food for thought for you today. Uh, Really, um, I'll lead with this. Is there really such a thing as in remission or is it remember my mission? Mm. We're going to talk today about how important it is to have hope, take heart, heal yourself to whole like the song My Way. And we have a hint and it's all cellular. Today, a very special lady I'm happy to showcase with you is Dr. Nasha Winters. Dr. Nisha Winters is a sought-after luminary and a global healthcare authority in integrative cancer research who consults with physicians around the world, bridging ancient therapies with advancements in modern medicine in the digital era. A personal journey with cancer and a medical career spanning over 25 years has Dr. Nisha on a mission to educate and empower the nearly 50% of the population expected to have cancer in their lifetime. Prevention is the only cure, she says. Dr. Nisha is also the best-selling co-author of The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, and this has been received worldwide. So applause, applause for all the accolades, and welcome, Dr. Nisha Winters. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. So excited to be here. It's just, it's, I, I love this, this boss lady concept. I love the, 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 the sort of preview that you gave everybody to doing it my way. I think that is so key with what we're going to dive into today. And I'm just really excited to be here with you, Dana. So thanks for having me. Thanks. You know, you inspired it because when we knew that we were doing the show with you, I am so, as I mentioned earlier, I first met you last year at Dr. V's conference. And when I saw you on the stage in Atlanta, I just, you were so powerful. You were rocking that blue dress. And (laughs) then I met you after and it was just a highlight for me, but you did it your way. So that inspired the Sinatra style. And it's funny. I just feel this kinship with you because I know we're on, it goes back to on our 48th year that really back in 1991, we were both 19 years old, except I was, you know, given a little news. I was a carrier of the Epstein-Barr virus. And I know you and I have both always had digestive issues, but rather than a little, you know, blood test saying that I had chronic fatigue syndrome, you got an expiration date and I don't want to you know, <laughs> give the farm away, but your story is extraordinary. We know the power of story and her story. So I know you tell it all the time, but it always affirms. So please do take it away, doc. And I'm so, yeah, just, I'm so happy you're here. It's all yours. (laughs) I know we've been trying to make this happen for some time. So it's, it's about time. So I'm really grateful to be here with you. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I get, I do get asked a lot to tell my story and for many, many years, I actually didn't. Um, or a variety of reasons around that. First of all, I think when you've gone through something like this, you just want it so far out of your you know, out of your rearview mirror as possible. And like so many others on this journey, once you think you're done with it, you think you're done with it. You know, you're like, good, move on next, can kind of compartmentalize and move forward. That was one facet of why I didn't really want to connect with it. The other facet is I also became a healthcare provider and became a practitioner who for the first few years of my practice, refused to work with cancer patients because that's how far I wanted it out of my life. I didn't even want it in my realm. Right. So um, I just didn't want to even bring it in, like invite it in. And of course, 
as you and your listeners likely know, the more you resist something, the more it comes and hunts you down. Uh, you know, hence the law of attraction type of process here. So instead, really, cancer chose me again in a very different way, different, different capacity. Um, and then the other side is when I did share my story with a few people over the years, especially early on within the first five or six years of my diagnosis, um, people met me with either disbelief, anger, which was interesting, um, condescendent, condescending, a lot of weird, I just got so much weirdness around it that it made other people more uncomfortable and then they put their stuff on me. So I really walked away from it. It really wasn't until I got sort of put on a stage on an ovarian cancer symposium in 2012 that I started to just give glimpses. People knew I had a cancer history, but I never talked about it. So they just probably assumed I had like a touch of something like a little basal cell or something, right? So I just let it be. Um, when I ended up speaking at this conference, because I had a few ladies that um, were miracles in themselves that had stage four ovarian cancers that really prompted me to do this, that kind of forced me onto the stage, it started coming out a little bit. And by the time I left private practice and just moved into consulting in 2014, I felt much more at ease to share this because there's something interesting when you are a doctor with your patient, you don't want them to totally meld with you and your story. I mean, you, you want to have a little bit of separation and that you want to be able to see them objectively and subjectively and them to see you objectively and subjectively. It needs to be a little bit of boundary so that I can give good care and they can receive good care. And my experience was my experience. Their experience is their experience. When you start to share that and people are like, I'm going to do what you did, that gets in trouble. That gets things in trouble. So I kept that kind of clean. And then the story started coming out in a lot of different places. And I will tell you part of why I'm kind of giving this backstory is why I'm not going to dive into the details again, because what's so interesting is what I'm finding. And this is my truth and my story this year that I didn't realize the more I started to tell my story after so many years, because in October 21st, 2020 will be 29 years since I was given a terminal diagnosis, as you alluded to in the beginning of our discussion of stage four ovarian cancer. It was so far gone, they couldn't do anything about it, okay? There was nothing left to be offered except for palliative care at best. And they said, even with treatment, I had about three months. So that was my option all those years ago. Clearly, um, I did not listen to their recommendations. I actually didn't expect to live. I mean, truly, I just wanted to understand why I was in the position I was in. So that I did it my way, I'm still doing it my way and helping tens of thousands of others do the same. But where I am today is what started happening in the last couple of years is I've been on over 300 podcasts and the book is out there and it's you know reaching over 75,000 sold copies over five languages at this point with two more coming out, two more books in the hopper, a lot going on, right? What I'm finding is just as I alluded to earlier, this kind of law of attraction. The last couple of years have been some really health challenging years for me. And it was starting to become very clear that the more I reconnected with my story, oh. the more I reconnected with my story. Getting chills, I get it. Yeah. So what I want to leave your listeners with is that I am here today because of my story and my experience, but I am not a cancer patient. I do not associate with that at all. I'm a person who learned some really powerful lessons. I saw cancer as a messenger. Even then I had some weird epiphany that brought me through that. And that's what I see it today. So what I, my role is to help people understand the why, understand the message and understand the opportunity. And frankly, it's going to sound kind of harsh. I really don't care about the story anymore. And I'm realizing that I had better success with myself and others when I focused on where we were going versus where we came from. Now, where we came from helps us understand to a certain extent, but once you understand that, you don't go back. I tell people like after they finish treatment, you don't go back to the soil, which made you sick. And sometimes that soil is a story or a trauma or a re-traumatization of sharing that story again and again. And even though I've been ch like chanting that with people for decades, I got sort of seduced back into it in the world of people saying, tell me your story, tell me the details. I didn't expect that. And so my sort of claim to reclaiming myself and my future forward is to um, remind people of that and don't get seduced by it. Yes, their story is who you are and what made you today, but there's a point when you need to let it go and create a new story. So I think it's obvious I've healed from something very traumatic 
um, came from a place where I told I couldn't. And my hope is that I inspire others to realize you're not a statistic. You are not your diagnosis. And you are your collection of patterns and life experiences that inform you in this moment and inform your decisions this moment forward. Right. It just, wow. That's, I it's so <laughs> didn't expect that, that one today, did you, Dana? Sorry about that. Well, you know, and it, it just reminds me of Madonna. She said before, if I have to sing like a virgin one more time, <laughs> it's, just, it's just, you know, yes. that's what comes top of mind when you say that. It just, because like you, I don't identify as a cancer patient. And I always yeah. reference it with what we ID with, you know, and I've made a note here before that you had said, basically, I don't let it ID me. I don't let it define me. So, and I'm not a cancer patient either, but the invitation is to explore, like you've said before, it's so seductive for anybody in cancer camp to think, oh, I got it because of this, this like singular point. And that's just not so it's multi-causal factorial. So I love that you explore all that. It just, so I don't want to go down that lane because especially if it's going to bring things up, I'll just leave it with this for anyone that's not familiar with your story. I'm just, how do I do this? I want to not, not, you know, like you can, you know, I, I my story is out there in the world for people yeah. to ask if they yeah. find it. But so, just no at worries. 19, when I said the expiration date, we'll just make it clear that it was end stage ovarian cancer period. So that's it. We're, we're done with that. We're, we're done. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's in, incredible. So 25 plus years now, and you have happy anniversary coming up. It yeah. just, it begs the question. I hear that all the time. Are you in remission? Are you cancer free? So, you know what, since we're all that sludge, everyone can go through it. Let, let's talk about it. Are we ever in remission? Are we ever cancer free? Cause I yeah. know what you think I want to hear it. Well, first of all, what I got goosies when you did the introduction, I've never heard that. I was like, that is a great, I hope you have that T end of, are we in remission or are we on a mission? Like that oh, was so stinking. Stole it. Total stole it. I took it from oh. the Hale documentary, I believe. Yeah. So good because that, <laughs> it. that is it. So again, because you know, the answer to this, uh, you know, we all, all of us, everyone listening everyone that they know that might know them listening, you know, everywhere out there, every single person alive on the planet today has cancer. Every one of us does. Okay. If you, if you actually dig hard enough, far enough, you sample enough pieces of tissue, you get enough uh, circulating tumor cell assays, you will find likely cancer cells in all of us. The issue is not the cancer cell. That is not the problem. The issue is what that cancer cell is floating around in. Okay. That's known as the terrain. That's what I call it. Uh, your, your kind of physiologists or biologists might call it the, um, extracellular matrix. Um, some call it the cytoplasma, some call it the, uh, micro, um, the cellular, like micro environment. So you'll hear these things and you'll even see those things in the standard literature, you know, medical literature as well. But basically we've spent the last 70 years in kind of a an experiment, if you will, really looking for and searching for the answers within the cell, the cancer cell, within the cancer tumor. Now, there's a lot of good information in there. There's a lot of important nuances that we've learned a lot about. But what's interesting is we've been targeting the tumor or the tumor cell for so many years, and we've barely moved the the, the dial. You know, we barely moved the needle on the dial of having really positive changes in the cancer story. So what I'm excited about is in the last mm, decade or so, even though I've been saying this for close to 30 years at this point, but in the last decade or so, we've really had a kind of a resurgence of some old concepts that got sort of buried back in the 1920s based on the work of a, of a biochemist uh, by the name of Dr. Otto Warburg, who started to recognize that cancer wasn't really a cell or a tumor, it was what those cells and tumors were floating around in, that microenvironment, terrain, extracellular matrix, and that it was really a function of metabolism within the cell. So the energy production within that cell. And so we have a certain sort of set of rules of our healthy cells, how they metabolize and how they're supposed to utilize fuel sources and move forward. But when basically those cells get bastardized, when they get bumped around a bit, when they uh, stew and some kind of nasty soup and sewage in that extracellular matrix over time, it changes its 
energy requirements and its energy output. And it's in that moment that the body becomes vulnerable. And it's in that moment that the cellular communication gets kind of jammed up and confused that these little cells start to metabolize their energy sources differently and start to just go off on their own. They, be, they go rogue. You know, um, one of my colleagues, Tina Kazor, she's a really well-known naturopathic oncologist, and she always calls the cancer cell a sociopath. <laughs> I love it. I was like, that's so brilliant because they are brilliant. They exactly. are shrewd. They are manipulative. They are resourceful and they give zero Fs about anybody and anything around them. They have no remorse and they will continue to gobble up all the resources and destroy all their relationships until the host is dead. Right. It's so yeah, yeah. just right? very erratic, unpredictable. And I love you mentioned Sir Otto. Uh, we're just about to go to break here, but it just, I, this is really interesting. When you discovered, I learned this, that in your little liberal arts college, pre-internet, this is how you discovered this. You like, in the old school library. This is the Dewey Decimal virtual. System. Remember those big old drawers you pulled out and dig around? And I actually was doing my work study in the library. So I had a lot of good hours in that library. And um, yeah, I ran across because I, I just was reading all that I could find on cancer at that time. And that's what I ran across because we had these very outdated old textbooks. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just, and by the time it goes to print, it's archaic anyway. But that therein, that was the moment when you discovered there's two camps, the soma camp, the metabolic camp. And that's when we get into what cancer is and what cancer isn't. So yeah. really, it, and you talk about it, the energy processing plant, I call it the lungs of the cells, really. Um, that. Would you say, before we go to break here, <laughs> is it fair to say that cancer is a disease of energy? Oh, that's interesting. Like misappropriated energy. Yeah. Yeah. One of my mentors says that um, environment is stronger than will. So when we treat mm -hmm. the train, that just makes me think of that. It just, you know, it's the company we keep. So. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Again, not mine. <laughs> totally. I know, but still, like we all learn from each other, right? <laughs> cool. Yeah, this is very perfect. I think that's a spot on assessment. Um, and it kind of goes on from kind of the cellular level all the way to the macro level, to the gross level, if you will. Quite interesting of like, where are you wasting your energy in life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are going to go to break right now. And then we'll be back with Dr. Nisha Winters. Do you drive yourself crazy trying to make important decisions? And when you finally do, then you start second guessing yourself. Would you like to know why you do this and how to change it? You can. When you take time to go inward, you'll find a wisdom that resides in the body. Begin by quieting your mind and sending your awareness into your body. Notice where there may be a discomfort. Ask it what it wants you to know. Listen carefully. It will reveal what it is about making this decision which holds you back. You can keep asking for information until you reach the deep core value of what keeps you from comfortably making a decision and sticking with it. Awareness is the first step toward making change. I'm Carrie Kadambi, and I'd love for you to join me on Transformation Talk Radio for my show, A Spirited Exchange. For more information about me, visit my website, thedivineguidancegift.com. Hi, this is Kimberly Carlson, and I would love for you to tune in to All In Healing Radio, where together we will begin to experience health, happiness, and harmony in all areas and aspects of life. Join us every first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. on TransformationTalkRadio.com. All In Healing will help you release layers of negative beliefs and energies for radiant health, deep joy, and greater abundance. Visit me at KimberlyCarlson.com. Are you ready to shift your life into overdrive and stop wasting your time? If so, then I want to invite you right now to the Body Regeneration Online Academy with me, Tracy L. In a world filled with so much information, you can get overloaded and confused, left feeling like you've tried everything and still no results. If this is you, 
then this platform is for you to help you step into your power, your intuition, and gain clarity. You will learn simple tools that you can use as you walk down the street, and I will teach you how to grow a stronger connection to the God consciousness. Imagine having me as your coach, shifting you, uplifting you, empowering you every week, and most of all, helping you stay connected so you can navigate your life's journey with ease and grace. Nothing will be able to get in your way. Plus, you will have a community filled with souls just like you to pick you up when you fall down and support you on your wins. No one can go this journey alone. If you are ready for your live activations, check me out at tracylclark.com and join the TLC Body Regeneration Online Academy now. Have you ever wondered what your pets think about? Do you know what your pets are saying to you? Dr. Monica will be your pet's translator to help you understand what your pets are trying to communicate to you. Enhance the bond with your furry friends on Pets Talk with Pet Communicator, Dr. Monica, each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information about Dr. Monica, visit PetCommunicator.com. Welcome back to Lady Boss, Handle the Lump, Heal Your Life with Dr. Nisha Winters. And we were just having a nice deep dive on all things cancer and not cancer because cancer is not just about, you know, what's happening in the body. It's about what's happening in your life too. And I know that Dr. Nisha has been doing this for a while, you know, having an anniversary celebration. We're not talking about cancer free, but a lot of people don't get cancering versus not cancering so let's can we speak to that let's talk about what's what's going on when we're cancering i love it well that's what we kind of started the last segment on was that all of us have cancer cells so we all have cancer but not all of us are cancering and we started to talk about the why of that with the kind of rogue metabolism and these cells that are like the sociopaths who say i'm gonna go do my own thing not think frank sinatra style (laughs) they think they're doing it their way but mm, they're kind of dangerous so what happens over time, you know, and as, as I allude to a lot in my book, the metabolic approach to cancer, you know, I always get people saying I was healthy till I got cancer. Now doing yoga and exercising and eating clean, that is not enough anymore in the world today. It, it isn't. So I'll hear people say, you know, I was a yoga instructor and I ate a really good diet and I, I had filtered water and I would jog every day. I'm like, okay, but what else? And what else? And what else? And so the, what else are these 10 fragments or these 10 short pathways. And that's going to allude to what helps us move from cancer to cancering, um, which is number one, epigenetics. So what was happening upstream from you anywhere from 12 generations down? Okay. So that's what the studies have shown us now that we are impacted. We are handed um, down lineages, a little blueprint that says, here's your working material and you choose what to do with it, depending on your diet, your lifestyle, the people you relate to, your stress responses, et cetera. So there's that piece. A lot of people don't realize they have a lot of knowledge and information in that um, blueprint to help them live a better life for themselves and take some preventative measures for themselves. So it's a very empowering tool when utilized appropriately. Second piece we already talked about in the last segment, which is the sources of fuel for the body. You know, we are meant to be a dual carb engine, you know, a dual engine of, of, of energy being moving back and forth easily, readily, flexibly, keyword here, into burning sugar and burning fat as needed, depending on seasons, cycles, stressors, activity level, energy requirements, you name it. Unfortunately, since uh, the industrialization of food, um, when we started actually doing more factory than farming, we have put a brick on the gas pedal of burning sugar. And today, less than, at least in the United States, less than 12% of Americans are actually considered metabolically flexible, meaning they can go back and forth between burning fat or sugar as needed. So what that means are um, the diseases that kill us today, cancer, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, those are the biggies. They're all metabolic mitochondrial diseases that have gotten the sugar uh, gas pedal stuck on full throttle forward. 
And you will hear clues of this when someone says to me, you know, I can't go more than 13 hours. You know, I can't do a 13 hour fast, which is simply going from dinner to breakfast, right? Most people are freaking out, trying to have a snack right at bed, getting up in the middle of the night to have a snack, eating the second they get out of bed in the morning. They can't go more than two to four hours without cramming something in their mouth. They're obsessing about food all the time. They get hangries or shaky or sweaty or nervous if they're away from food. That is metabolic inflexibility. If and we're taught, like that, we're taught. Oh, yeah. oh you a couple hours. Don't forget, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And of course, what are we told to reach for? Quick carbs. You know, even though good carbs, like that's what we want. And most of us are reaching for those just out of habit, reach those out of addiction because it's hitting the same dopamine receptors in the brain as cocaine. We're reaching for it because we're lacking joy in our life. So we're looking for fulfillment of sweetness through our food since we're not getting sweetness in our life. Um, we are metabolically broken. And when you're metabolically broken, you're going to crave more of that fast energy because you're not efficient. And so that's what's happened in the last bit that we've lost our ability to ease back and forth readily into burning um, fats and burning sugars. So that leads to a lot of chronic illnesses and, and problems with how you respond to your therapies. So if people are, for instance, higher in insulin or glucose, they're not going to react. They're not going to respond well to radiation. Radiation, the cancer cells become desensitized to radiation when sugar is high in the system or certain medications like PARP inhibitors. Um, interestingly enough, in your population here, a lot of women get put on a, um, a tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. These drugs cause the very freaking problem that led to their cancer diagnosis, it causes metabolic syndrome, more metabolic inflexibility, fatty liver diabetes, just look at the drug inserts. So it's like, again, as I said before, not even wanting to tell a story, you also don't want to keep taking medications that put you right back into the soil that made you sick. So if you can't avoid those drugs, or there's a reason why you need those drugs, or you're drawn to using those drugs, you must work even harder to overcome what those drugs are creating in your system. And you can, no problem, but you got to work harder at it right? So you cannot just put your head in the sand and pretend that the drugs are going to do it for you. What they will do for you is give you that 70% recurrence rate, which is the label hanging over you out there in the world today. So when people then tell me, well, I don't understand. I did everything right. And I got cancer again. Well, did you look in the soil? Most people don't. And if people get first diagnosed, when you tell them to look in the soil, they often get upset thinking that you're blaming them. Now, when I hear people say that, that tells me you should go and read chapter nine and 10 of my book right away, because that's your BS. That's sorry. I'm putting that right back on you. If you think someone's blaming you, when we tell you educate, create awareness and empower yourself, that means there's some deep, dark shit in your mind and your spirit that needs to be worked on. <laughs> so I get it pretty harsh with my patients on that because you cannot heal if you do not work on your stress response and your emotional intelligence and right. the wounds that led you to this place. These are huge. So please, it's an invitation to go deeper. And of course you didn't know until you know, but once you know, then it is in your court. I've heard you say that before. It's basically like hot potato of the power. So <laughs> I love your analogies, these are awesome. Um, just, you know, not reinventing the wheel. The, you know, it's one thing, the day of diagnosis, not your fault, but I've heard you say before, once you know, you can't unknow. And then if you don't treat your terrain, take care of the environment, like you say, it, it is our fault. Once we know better, we do better. Right. And I, I love seeing you on radical remission through Hay House and with Dr. Um, Christian Northrop, who we guest featured her too. And I love her. She mm -hmm. says, once you start talking food, you're talking religion. And what you're saying is basically, you know, for someone that, and it's group think we're taught, we can't go, we have to blood sugar balance. It's, it goes counter everything we've been instructed to do. But there's a spectrum, like you say, with vegetarianism and with ketoism, therapeutically, it doesn't mean you have to do it forever, but okay. really the approach. Can you speak the truth on religion, on what yes, I would <laughs> First, I tell people all the time, dogma kills, yeah. no matter what camp you're in. Okay. So yeah. I, I can remember very ex explicitly a, a, a colleague of mine in medical school who came into our program, a hardcore vegan. He was world famous. He was a vegan leader, teacher, ran a whole group for, he was like probably one of the early adopters of veganism and really a big pusher and known for his work today. While we were all in school, we remember all looking at him thinking something's not right. 
he had major bruises. His skin was super gaunt. It was super pale. Um, his, my Chinese medical professor told him that he had a, a glass tongue, which you learn later in time. That's a, that's ominous sign of something going on. His hair was super brittle and falling out. He was diagnosed in our last year of medical school with stomach cancer. This is a person who was a vegan. And what it did for him is you'd think it would make him change up. It's like, if you've been doing something this way for a while and it's not working, change. Pretty simple. No matter what direction, if you were in the carnivore camp, right? It's like, great. It's not working anymore. Change direction. The pivot is what's important. The ability to adapt and move where you need to based on your body's information, data that's coming out is key. What it did for him, it drove him even deeper into it. And I was watching this guy putting around, putting down quarts and quarts of carrot juice a day, pounds of dates a day, a quart of honey a week because it was all raw food, all really good, all clean, but it was like a sugar. This is a guy who was an O blood type who was basically auto digesting his GI tract as we, sp as we spoke, super high hydrochloric acid, didn't have anything to digest. It needed some meat to digest in him. And he died a horrible death. We watched it happen over three years and it was incredibly painful. And he died of his dogma, not of his cancer. That wow. was really critical. So when I see these folks getting out there, I learned this way too. I started out dogmatic. I started out as a dogmatic. I mean, I was the worst standard American diet person you could possibly imagine. My stories are hilarious for that piece. Moved into veganism. That's what I knew. Into Gerson. And of course, at that time, though, I started reading about Father Gerson's work, you know, the, the father of the whole thing. And at that time, um, I was able to get liver injections. I wouldn't eat it, but I was doing liver injections because that was part of the original plan. And I also was following more the original plan of green ju juices and getting lots and lots of potassium and lowering my sodium levels. So I was doing what was considered the original work of this. And I was having some pretty good benefit. But over time, my body needed something else. So then I started incorporating some eggs did that for another decade or two, <laughs> you know, and then over time I started learning more things as I was getting all my autoimmune things started flaring. So rheumatoid arthritis, celiac, Hashimoto's, polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, lovely little collection. What was happening is I was pretty much, and I was also about 40 pounds heavier than I am right now, no matter how hard I worked out two hours a day with a hardcore hit fitness lady. Um, my caloric, I was, I could not eat. If I ate more than a thousand calories a day, I would just explode. Um, you know, my weight, but I was carrying about 40, 45 extra pounds on me, but my diet, when I started to assess it on those little macronutrient counters, I was eating between 30, 300 and 400 carbo grams of carbohydrate a day as my vegetarian diet. And I was sequestering a ton of glyphosate and all of the grains and the legumes that I was using to get my protein. Yeah, I was getting my protein sources, but to get your protein sources that took up all my carbohydrate. And that was then when I started really assessing my blood much more effectively, I realized I was basically full bore diabetic, which was aggravating my endometriosis and my polycystic ovarian syndrome, which are both basically diabetes of the reproductive organs, um, as well as uh, my Hashimoto's was flaring like crazy. It would take me until 2006 to learn that my Hashimoto's was driven by all of the iodine I was ingesting, by all the well-meaning people out there, and by all the gluten I was ingesting as a, as a vegetarian. And then it was not until 2000, probably eight, when I really learned my epigenetics to realize I didn't have the amylase enzymes to break down the, um, the carbohydrates, you know, to break down the sugars in my high carbohydrate foods. I was really meant to be, I was an A blood type. So you'd think I should be a vegetarian, but I was needing to be a vegetarian who ate some poultry, some fish, some eggs. It doesn't take much protein to make me tick. But I started learning about that. It wasn't until 2010 when I finally got rid of all grains and all of my autoimmune and leaky gut patterns went away. And I easily dropped, you know, 45 pounds without, with no time, with no trying. It was like amazing for all the years I've been battling. I'd never been in a single digit dress size since junior high. Right. And here it was into my forties. I'm now, you know, into my thirties and forties, I'm now like smaller than I was in junior high. So those types of things were the awareness that I learned along the way. And I switched gears. So what's funny is when you land on a stage, after a book comes out or after a podcast or something, everyone just assumed that you landed there and that you figured this out right in that moment. I'm like, no, nobody Lock. sees beneath the iceberg. Nobody sees right? that. Right. And Rumbling around in the darkness. I came to that point. And that point of me sharing that with you guys is that we're all biochemically individual. We all have different things that make us tick. 
We all have things we need at certain times for certain reasons, and we all need to be willing to be flexible and adaptable to that. So if you can't have metabolic flexibility at the cellular level, you're likely not having life flexibility on the macro level. Oh. Oh, there's a big truth bomb. You know, before we get away from all our yummy coffee talk here, how can we get more metabolic magic with you? So this is, can you give us a big plug promo for you? I loved um, your Allison. That's oh, great. Yeah, I love yeah. watching her on um, Radical Remission. But yeah, tell us, how can, how can anyone get some magic from you? Where do they go? Specifically on how to learn more about these types of things. So the metabolic approach to cancer book is excellent. So we talked about the 10 factors. I, we hit two so far. I'll quickly come through this because I know we're coming to a break. So we talked about epigenetics, metabolic. The other things we talk about are toxicants in the book, microbiome, immune system, inflammation, circulation and angiogenesis, hormonal balance, stress, circadian rhythm balance, and mental emotional balance. In the book, we dive deep into all of those metabolic approach to cancer. Okay. Thank you. And uh, because I know you're in hot demand around the world, I don't believe you're taking on clients one-on-one anymore, but you have resources and systems set up that people can be of service. I would love to share with you guys what's on the, on what's happening right now, because there's some really amazing things happening. Thank you, COVID crisis. uh, That's giving us a great way to pivot and be more accessible to the world around us. Yeah. Virtual space. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay. And you know, you're famous for tracking the tangible test, assess, don't guess. Can you tell us that? What are, what are are the three things? Like Dr. Anna Kabeca says, you know, know your numbers, like your dress size hit us. What do we need to know? Yeah. So again, test, assess, address, don't guess. When someone says, well, this is my diet and I do it because this works for me, or this is, I did that diet. It didn't work for me. Well, first of all, how did you know? Like if you have feeling there's a quad, there's certainly a, a subjective experience with things, right? For sure. No doubt about it. But sometimes our, again, our attachments are as such. So it's helpful to get objective data. So all my patients, I request a CBC with differential, which is your basic blood count. And that gives me a really humongous snapshot of your blood chemistry. It's a $12 out of pocket test. And I actually just did a with ONI, Oncology Nutrition Institute, they actually just did a little podcast with me, an hour and a half, I went through how to use your CBC. And it is incredible how much information. So you can go check out their website and get access to that. It's, it's just you know, a, little thing I, a little thing I did with them, but to show you the deep dive of how much you can learn about your functioning immune system and your nutrients and whatnot on a simple $12 test is pretty provocative. The other test we look at is a CMP, your metabolic functions. There's your, there's your um, organ function your electrolytes, your glucose levels. And then we look at what my patients have coined as the trifecta. The trifecta is your sedimentation rate, how fast your blood falls out of solution. Um, if it drops really quickly, um, that's a good sign. That means you're, there's no viscosity. There's no like fibrinogen stuff in there, like clumping things up. You don't have a scaffolding for cancer cells to crawl around on, to migrate around the building. You want your stuff to fall out quickly. The longer it takes for things to fall out, the more goopy that cytoplasma, the more goopy that extracellular matrix and the higher incidence of all chronic conditions, including cancer. Lactose dehydrogenase, LDH, not to be confused with LDL, which unfortunately most physicians confuse, which is frightening to me, but there we have it. Lactose dehydrogenase is a marker of your mitochondrial function. It is a marker of many things metabolic and it's ignored. And it's probably one of the most important tests we can run. And it's, I have to like beg, borrow and steal to have people run it for us, but we want to have a very narrow range. We don't want it too low. We don't want it too high. Um, And then we have C-reactive protein. Most of your listeners probably know of that, which is a, a general marker of inflammation. But when you pair those three together, they give you a very specific visual into the health and well-being of the cytoplasma terrain, extracellular matrix, they show me whether cancer's in the driver's seat or whether your terrain is in the driver's seat. Mm. They show me levels of acidosis. They show me levels of med- metabolic functioning. They show me levels of angiogenesis. They show me levels of response to, th- to treatments, um, good or bad. And that actually for me is way more telling than a scan or a tumor marker. And people always get shocked. So for instance, if I have someone say, yay, ring the bell, I just finished chemo and radiation, the whole bit and everything's good. And my numbers, my breast cancer markers are perfect and my scans are clear. And I'm looking at their trifecta and all three of them are out of my functional ranges. 
I am telling you right now, after looking at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these patterns over nearly 30 year career, I'm terrified for that patient because I know it's a matter of weeks or months before cancer is exploding. I know it. And it's, and sadly I'm right. And I don't want to be, it's one of those moments you pray that you're not. And the other side, interestingly enough, this is why tumor doesn't matter why I'm almost 30 years out with still things in my body that haven't been removed and eradicated and destroyed because they're part of me. They are who I am. I just keep them in peace. If I have a patient with still stuff showing up on scans and elevated tumor markers, but their trifecta is perfect, I'm not worried. Like I know like, "Eh, yeah, we can still keep working on, we can still keep digging in the dirt and finding out what might be triggers to these things, why they arose in your body and how we can keep it at bay. But I know you're in the driver's seat, not your cancer. And that has also proven true. I love hearing that. Thank you. Because we know that fear is the fuel driver of metastasis. So just like the, we know, we know, we know this little thing called a virus. We know what fear can do. So let's not have any more of that unnecessarily. So it's so important. Um, I know you, the tangibles track, we look at those numbers, then the, the side effect is we get to see the benefit and then we get brave to go into the deep dive of the emotional piece. Oh, I love that. That's good. That's like your gateway drug is the tangibles. Yeah. And if you stabilize and feel a little trusting there because you have those built-in biomarker metrics, giving you instant feedback, then it starts to feel a little bit safer to say, now I can exhale and really start to address what might have been perhaps some of the most significant triggers of all of this. It's true. There's a feedback loop too, because having confidence in the plan that breeds the courage, having courage, you take a step in action and then the confidence comes. So it goes together. So I love the stuff you've said before. We have spoke about it before the ACE study. It's so important. So I think it, it bears repeating. What do you have to say about the, the type C personality? Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? First of all, I think first of all, women are so good at this. Number one, we're very good at being type C in general which is basically caregiver on crack. Okay. So C and C. Um, And so what that means is like, we are, we are natural nurturers. That is what we came here to do. Whether you had children move through your body or not, you may be caregiving a pet, a a, a career, um, a parent that's ailing, a, a friend, a partner, your own children, whatever it may be. You may be creating something beautiful in, in art or whatnot, but it's a creativity piece here. But if it gets to be the point where you forget you and the mix and all of those other things become your focus and you forget your own self-care, that can throw those terrain 10 patterns even further out of the mix. And so what I hear a lot of women say who come to me with a type C personality, there's guilt around what they assume is something considered selfish. And I'm like, you can't take care of others. If you're not selfish, you, you like that concept. I love the analogy on the airplanes, like put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you support the person next to you, the child, etc. You will be a better parent. You will be a better partner. You will be a better um, business. You'll be our better physician. You will be a better, all of these things. If you do your self care, it is extremely clear to me when I'm not taking care of myself, when my patients suffer. It's extremely clear to me when I'm not taking care of myself, when my marriage suffers, when my friendships suffer, when I start to feel resentment or when I start to feel overwhelmed. I'm like, oh, okay. And instead of listening to that, you know, ignoring that, or as Allison Gannett that you mentioned, you know, talks about putting the sticker over the check engine light on your dashboard. (laughs) Just, yeah, you know what I loved about Allison is she looked like, like you say, the enigma, all these people, but I was so healthy. How did this happen? She looked like the picture of health. So yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. I want to, I want to be her. Yeah. Yeah, like her now. Dumper, a pro mountain biker. She taught women how to do these things, all these great stuff. When we looked under the hood, it was frightening. It was yeah. Frightening. And, and you're, yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I look at patients. She'll, yeah huge, right? So she's really good about this. And I've, I've looked at patients so where, where their family members get inspired to run labs as well. And I've looked at their, their, their kids labs and they often are scarier than the patient that I'm helping go through cancer. Holy cow. I want to shine some light for you. What you say about in your family, the lineage, you didn't want to play the victim card and you come from some serious, uh, warrior women. I mean, just, 
not having it. So, and the opposite of victimhood is agency. And you yeah. talk about the gifts, about the gift of anger. So this just <laughs> made me think of you. I love Gloria Steinem. And she says that women have a lot to be pissed off about, but it <laughs> becomes her. So I wanted, it just made me think for you that the gift of anger for you was going into hot pursuit, being the outlier, that being tenacious. And this is, this is the approach. If we sit there in victimhood and like we can own all day long and in lotus position, but unless we get into action. Yes. Yes. It, and you know, in Chinese medicine, anger. I love it. The will to, to become. become. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? So when you oh. said that, it was funny because my, my, and when I was in high school, my friends called me tenacious, nacious. So there's always been a bit of that in there. I've always been a bit of the black sheep in my whole world, but I also was very wounded and very traumatized. And there was a lot of toxicity in my upbringing, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And so there was a point where I got exhausted from being tenacious and that's where I didn't want to be here anymore. And so for me, um, that diagnosis was an opportunity. It was a pilot light to wake me up and say, okay, we're going to do tenacious in a different way. We're going to, we're going to use this. We're going to use it as a will to become something different than where I came from because there were so many grooves of expectations of this is all it's going to be. This is all you got. This is, this is good as it gets. And there was just something that sparked in me that said, Nope, there's a lot more. And anger was the driver. When someone told me that I could not, you know, though I never wanted to live when they told me I couldn't live anymore, that little tenacious nations came out in full force and was like, okay, well, I'll show you. And I didn't really, like I said, expect to, but I thought I'm going to die kicking and screaming and understanding why. And each time I got past it, a week past that three months, a month past that three months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years with people still saying, especially once we learned my genomics down the road and the BRCA and all these other things, like you're going to be dead. You're going to be dead. You're going to be dead. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. Like everything, or it's going to get bigger. Like you can't even believe how many times it's people have said it's you're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done in my life. And a lot of things, it just fires me up more. And I don't know if that's my redhead, you know, redhead tendency, you know, you do not want to see a, a, an angry redhead. I don't know if it's the tenacious warrior women in my family. I don't know if it was the, the, the death sentence, you know, and, and meeting people who said it can't be done, whatever it was, I took it by the reins. And that's where I think that we can find that little spark in each of us and help people find that spark to get them going. And it may manifest very differently. Maybe it's through a place of compassion. Maybe you have been fiery all your life and you need to cool it down. You know, maybe you've been very, um, you know, organized and, you know, dealt with this, but now you need to kind of be a hot mess for a while. You know, whatever it may be, like I said, where we make change is if you started here and that's not working for you in whatever part of life, you have to go somewhere else. Sometimes we pendulum far to one corner. I'm definitely notorious for doing that. And then we kind of bounce around till we find our little happy place somewhere in between. But that's where a lot of people talk about the diet. Like why does some people do great with vegans? Some do great with carnivore and everything in between. It's because ultimately those are pretty intense changes, whatever you chose to do. And it will initially be a very, bloop, like a, what we call a vertical jump in change in a paradigm shift in a, in a cellular shift. But then over time that kind of becomes numbed out a little bit and needs changing as well. That's why we continue to test, assess, address the terrain. And so when someone says this is working for me or it's not, that's where I'm like, prove it to me. Show me the data, show me the numbers, show me the money and we'll dig in deeper. And then, and only then can you start to really track your trajectory and give yourself the feedback to know on the right path, not on the right path, correct. And get on the right path. It's that simple. Test, assess, yeah. address, don't guess. I love it. It, it um, yeah, it, it, it's some word, you know, words to live by. And the science is catching up now, finally, because you had said before, and historically for 50 years, not a whole lot was doing, but now finally, but even still, I love you, how you give the example at Harvard, down the hall is one camp that believes in somatic, that it's just, you know, it's the hand you're dealt with and same institution down the other hall at Harvard, 
is the metabolic approach yep. and which is a lot more of agency, a lot more of responsibility, a lot more of the can do. And what we know for sure, if we were to sum it up, what we know for sure, I like what you said before about the fundamentals of immunology is that to recognize, to, to recognize, to uh, respond and to remember. And that's the job of the immune system. I yeah. just, I, and I thought that was beautiful when you said that, because what we know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening right now in this crazy crisis. Everyone's immune systems are broken because if you're being bathed in stress, you're being bathed in exogenous endocrine disrupting chemicals. You're being bathed in um, sugar that suppresses your immune system. If you're uh, a circadian rhythm is totally screwed up and you're in front of blue screens all the time. So we got our little blue, blue blockers on if you're in front of screen time all the time. And you're up past 11 PM and you're, you know, not out in the sunshine, you know, early morning light, late evening light, and getting that sun, we're just like big sunflowers, you know, ourselves, all of those things start to make you much more vulnerable. So to me, COVID is the wake up call to the world. We've lost our flexibility. We've lost our rhythm. We've lost our way. We've lost that ability to recognize, respond, and remember. And that's the scary thing right now as we're seeing these hyper responders, that's the cytokine storm. We're seeing the folks who don't respond at all and then are like dropping dead of a weird like heart attack or stroke after the fact. And then we have sort of everything in between. We have the people who have kind of a good immune system, they get good and sick and it's miserable and doesn't feel good. But then they're like, wow, kind of got an upgrade moving on in life. Those are the people that are still have price and functioning immune systems. And so instead of hiding us all from each other, we need to start educating and empowering each other. And this is exactly the story of cancer. Exactly. That it's the same thing. It's like, you can't hide from it. It will find you. So you have to prepare for it. You have to prepare for what is in your own terrain. You, you have to amend your own soil. You have to take a look at what the nutrients are in your soil and deal with them. You know, you got to pluck those weeds. You got to water it. You got to give it some sunlight. And in paying attention, the, the phraseology is so important too. tend and mend and to pay attention is to pay. There's an energy exchange. Mm -hmm. Like you're really, you're attending, you, right. you pay attention to it because bodies are honest and they don't lie. You know, it just, it, yeah it's body talk getting in touch with it. So another thing you've shared so many good bits before, would you please share with us what you learned from Carolyn Mace? That's a, that's a beautiful thing about the spiritual journey. Oh my gosh. What have I not learned from Carolyn? Well, well I'll, Goodness. I'll, I mean, I'll with it. She says, if I, I, I heard it from you that, um, until you figure yeah. out basically you cannot medically heal cancer with an intervention until you spiritually change yeah. what yeah. the cancer came, was designed to inspire. So you can't heal on a physical level until yeah. you heal the soul level that, that, that the disease was designed to inspire and heal. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I tell you, like cancer is not the enemy. It is you. It's you losing touch and losing that rhythm and that balance and that connection and that awareness and that communication and that energetic exchange. And it's just gone rogue. And it's just like, a, like if you had, you know, if you've got a child that's got um, disabilities or you have a child that's, you know, gone to a birthday party and has gone on a bender of sugar, or you have a child that's, you know, on the spectrum, for instance, they're not, I mean, she's, or if you're just a teenager, like my mom tells me she survived me all the time. Um, you know, like, <laughs> these are these moments where like, you might want to kill them, but is that a good idea? <laughs> right. And so you need to understand them and you need to try and meet them where they are. And you need to try and maybe create some different boundaries and some different rules and some different ways to support and nourish and nurture them in a way that there's an, a, 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 an ebb and a flow and an ease within, you know, it's like, that's us. It's like, it's like the little tormented child within that's coming out begging for support, for paying attention, for boundaries, for care. Yeah. We had well, our last guest, she taught us that boundaries are about in between me and me really. Isn't that so important? She talks about the three sisters of, um, but she being selfish, we say the oxygen mask. I like this instead. Self 
full. <laughs> That's great. Selfish, just yeah. self -full. It's a nice little reframe. And reframe. Beautiful. Uh, we're coming to an end right now. And I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say goodbye because I know there's so much good for you. It's just, you have the integrated experience of being a naturopathic physician. You've lived it. You know what you're talking about. So you've got, you've got the hard won wisdom. So there's, there's so much that you offer. And really, I know you've shared a poem with, from Emily uh, Dickinson before. It's just, do you remember that top of mind? Oh, I mean, I, I, I'll probably completely destroy it, but if you have it in front of you, but it's basically this concept that what are we without hope? Like hope, hope is it. It's, it's what's, it's the wings that take off in helping carry us. Yeah. yeah. It is. And it, yeah, it's an honorable fuel, really. It's just, um, we, there's nothing without hope. So thanks for doing it your way. Thanks for doing it Sinatra style. And really it just, I invite anyone to check out Dr. Nasha Winters. Uh, you, the systems that you have in place, I know you have a whole team, Allison from Radical Remission. She's there to help everybody because there's just, you know, the world needs more Dr. Nasha. So. so you know, and your listeners know on my website, drnasha.com, I've got my list of patient advocates, which are like your metabolic coaches, your, your fo folks who can help you go down the, the rabbit hole of mental, emotional support. Uh, the folks who can help you with the fitness routine. I have those well vetted people that I've worked with for years, but I also watch my website in the next couple of weeks as I've just graduated my first 12 doctors in the metabolic approach to cancer yeah. who are really trained in this. They're scattered all over the country and even around the world. And we are connect continuing with this. And these are vetted people who approach this the same way I do, since I no longer am able to serve people one-on-one, -on -one, I'm teaching doctors to serve you. So we're exploding out with resources. And I'm very excited because it's also segueing into the first and only truly integrative metabolic forward residential hospital and research institute on the soil of the United States. We're the <laughs> biggest piece you can possibly manage imagine. And it is in our room, we'll have chemo and radiation, but it'll be reimagined. It'll be done on a very precision base, metronomic, low dose, coupled with what exactly your epigenetics, your tissue assays, your labs, your lifestyle, your ACE scores all are requiring. So you have an absolute target from the get-go versus a guessing game along the way. Well done. I just, you know, thank you for doing the big job in the world. You're just such a you're playing full out and showing us how to do it. And thank you for believing big and dreaming bigger. So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time with us here today with Dr. Nisha Winters. Thanks, Dana. Blessings all. You've been listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, Lady Boss, Women Inspiring Women, featuring leading edge entrepreneurs who are putting the focus on empathic leadership in today's modern day world. Text the word Cornelia to the number 22828 and receive her weekly newsletters. For more information on Cornelia Stephanie and her extraordinary work, or to listen to past shows, go to corneliastephanie.com. <laughs>